So today I thought I'd begin a series of, let's say, you know, portfolios, examining some of the great ancient Sith Lords that existed millennia before Vader and Palpatine. And I thought who else to begin this series with, but the very first Sith Lord, Ajunta Pal. Ajunta Pal was a human male. He was a Jedi during a time when the Order was just surviving its first truly existential crisis, which would come to be known as the First Great Schism. It had resulted from a split between those who followed the more traditional practices of the Force and another group of Jedi that had begun to study alternative methods of utilizing it. Eventually, the crisis would lead to a war, which the Jedi won against those heretical members. Anyways, Ajunta was born after this and was strong in the Force, progressing through his training within the Order, until he eventually achieved the rank of Jedi Master. There, he began to study the mysterious arts of alchemy and soon through his rigorous research uncovered the secrets of creating and shaping life itself. Appalled by the power Ajunta had unveiled, the Jedi High Council deemed it to be an abhorrence to the Force and forbid its practice, barring Ajunta from teaching it to his followers. Angered by what he perceived to be the arrogance of the Council, Ajunta, with his many followers, declared war on the Jedi Order, initiating the Second Great Schism. This started a century-long conflict that would be known as the Hundred Year Darkness, which I'm going to cover in another video. Towards the end of the conflict, the now titled High General Ajunta Pal slaughtered more than a dozen Jedi during the final battle of the war on the Outer Rim planet, Corbos, near the Yavin system. However, despite his and his Dark Jedi disciples' obvious power, the Jedi were triumphant. Defeated and captured, Ajunta and his forces were stripped of their ranks and weapons, then sent into exile outside of Republic space. These exiles searched system after system for a habitable place to live, until they eventually came upon a remote and foreboding desert world in the Outer Rim. This place was called Korriban, where not only could they survive on, but the planet also hosted a relatively primitive Force-sensitive red-skinned species called the Sith. Ajunta and his Dark Jedi were intrigued by these natives' creative use of the Force. Initially, the Sith habitants did not take well to exiles intruding on their world. So, their king, Hakagram Grouch, attempted to resist the Dark Jedi's efforts at conquering his people while also trying to crush their desires at reaping his species' secret knowledge of the Force. However, Ajunta was able to convince the king's second-in-command, known as the Shadow Hand, to switch sides and join him. Betrayed, the king soon fell to his own war sword in the hands of Ajunta. Afterwards, in awe of the skill and power Ajunta and his Dark Jedi had demonstrated, as well as being impressed with the advanced technology, the Sith species quickly began to worship the exiles as gods, much like the Ewoks worship C-3PO. Now the subjects of Ajunta, the Sith, revered him as the Gen Ari, which translates to Dark Lord. Ajunta Pal, former Jedi Master, former High General, was now the first Dark Lord of the Sith in existence. He soon founded the First Sith Empire, which he expanded beyond Corbin to other worlds, including the Dark Forest planet Zyost, where he set up his capital and made his new home. After many decades, the First Sith Lord eventually passed on, but his empire lived on without him. His body was returned to Corbin and placed within a massive tomb, in what would one day be known as the Valley of the Dark Lords. Though his body was dead, his expansive knowledge of alchemy that the Jedi had forbidden allowed him to attach his spirit to the physical world, and so his essence remained persistent within his tomb for centuries. During this time, he studied the Sith Lords that came after him and saw how each time their ultimate downfall was usually at the hand of each other. And so, Ajunta began to examine his choices and actions that he made when he was alive. During the Jedi Civil War, millennia after his death, a Jedi Knight, undercover as a Sith apprentice named Revan, entered Ajunta's tomb to retrieve the Sith Lord's sword. Now, on a side note, this had belonged to King Hakagram Grouches originally, and it was buried along with Ajunta. Revan needed access to an ancient artifact called a Star Map, and in order to do so, he needed to gain prestige from the Sith Academy on Korriban. And so, he hoped, returning with the sword of the first Dark Lord of the Sith, would give him that prestige. However, Ajunta's spirit appeared in front of the Jedi and spoke of his disappointment and shame for his actions as a Sith Lord. He no longer blamed the Jedi for the destruction the Sith Order had regularly met after the Hundred Year Darkness. No, 
Ajunta saw that the Sith's hunger for power always led them to destroy each other, and he felt nothing but remorse for his hand in creating their order. Revan took the sword and then convinced Ajunta's spirit to cast aside the darkness and return to the light side of the Force. Letting go of all of his hate and pain, Ajunta became one with the Force, finding peace at long last. So, like the last Sith Lord, you know, well, you know, until Episode 9 at least, Darth Vader, the first was also a Jedi who fell, but was eventually redeemed into the light. I kind of feel like Ajunta and Anakin had a lot in common. However, I would like to know more about Ajunta's reasonings for going as extreme as he did. I guess, you know, he just didn't like the way the Jedi ran things, but at least Anakin was kind of just cornered into it because he wanted to save Padme. Hello everyone, how are you all doing today? Today we return to the Legends novel, Darth Bane, The Path of Destruction. We're going to be looking at pages 208 to 210, chapter 20, where Bane takes the title of Darth. Now, I'm jumping really far into the novel here, primarily because I want to get you guys really interested for the not-so-crazy fans about Legends to really help you guys understand how cool Legends actually is, and where a lot of the lore for canon really was inspired from. So if you find yourself interested in the lore in this video, as the title is pretty interesting, bringing a lot of new faces, I implore you to go check out some of the other lore videos that are out there, not just on my channel, but anywhere really on YouTube. They're all very interesting, and I think we can learn a lot from the inspiration that came to canon today. That being said, I'm going to be covering so much more of the Darth Bane novel and continuing my novelization coverage of Legends and Canon comics going forwards. So at this point in the novel, Bane has crossed a threshold into a new understanding and connection with the dark side. He has just walked away victorious from a trap set by his former rival, Sirak. Now we're going to learn a ton more about Sirak in more videos which are going to backtrack from this one and then we'll go beyond chapter 20 as well. He is now done with the Sith Academy and its instructors permanently and finally ready to break out of his own away from Lord Khan and his Brotherhood of Darkness. As he storms furiously to the Academy's headmaster, Lord Cordis' quarters, there remains only one last step for Bane to take, a dangerous and forbidden step. Bane kicked open the door to Cordis' chamber. It slammed against the wall with a crash that reverberated down the hall. The Academy's master had been awake and already dressed, meditating on the mat in the center of his room. Now, he leapt to his feet, anger darkening his face. What is the meaning of this? Did you send Sirak to kill me? Bane blurted out. The time for subtlety was gone. What? I... Did something happen to Sirak? I killed him. Yevra and Loke too. Their bodies are in the archives. The shock and horror of his reaction made it clear that Quartus had known nothing about the attack. You did this on the eve of our departure for Rusan? He asked, his voice rising shrilly. A few of the other masters had gathered in the corridor outside, drawn by Bane's loud arrival. A handful of the students as well. Bane didn't care. You can go to Rusan, Bane snapped. I will have nothing to do with the Brotherhood of Darkness. You are a student of this academy, Cordis reminded him. You will do as you're told. I am a Dark Lord of the Sith, Bane countered. I serve no one but myself. Glancing over Bane's shoulder at the gathering crowd of curious onlookers, Cordis dropped his voice to a threatening whisper. We leave for Rusan tomorrow, Lord Bane. You will be coming with us. This is not a matter for discussion. I am leaving tonight. Bane replied, lowering his voice to match and mock the tone of Cordis's own, and none of you here is strong enough to stop me. He turned his back on the head of the academy and walked slowly from the room. For a brief second he felt the spurned master gathering the force, and Bane braced himself for a confrontation, but a second later he felt the power fading away. At the threshold he halted. When he spoke, he was addressing the assembled gawkers as much as Quartus. Someone here once told me the Darth title was no longer used because it promoted rivalry among the Sith. It gave the Jedi an easy target. It was easier just to abandon the custom, to have all the Sith Masters use the same title of Dark Lord. He raised his voice slightly, speaking loud enough for all to hear. But I know the truth, Quartus. I know why none of you claims that name for yourself. Fear. Your cowards. He half turned and looked back at Cordis. None of the Brotherhood is worthy of the Darth title. Least of all you. There was a gasp from the assemblage. Some of the students stepped back, expecting some type of reaction. Of course, there was none. Shaking his head in disgust, Bane left them there. As he passed the other masters, Kasim stepped in front of him, placing a hand on his chest. Don't go, the Blade Master said. 
Let's talk about this. If you just meet me with Khan, you'll understand. That's all I ask, Bane. It's Darth Bane, he said, slapping the Twi'lek's hand away and pushing past him. Nobody else tried to stop him as he made his way through the temple's halls. Nobody tried to follow him or even called out as he mounted the stairs to the small landing pad on the roof. There was only a single ship at the starport, the Valsin, a T-class long-range personal cruiser. The blade-shaped vessel was one of the finest in the Sith fleet, equipped with the latest and most advanced technology. It had arrived just the day before, a gift from Khan to Cordis in recognition of his work with the apprentices at the academy. Bane lowered the access hatch and climbed inside. During his stint in the military, he'd been given rudimentary training in the basics of piloting a standard hyperdrive vessel. Fortunately, the Valsen's controls matched all intergalactic standards of operation and were designed for ease of use. He sat himself down in the pilot's chair and fired up the thrusters, punching in the hyperspace coordinates of his destination even as he began the liftoff sequence. A moment later, the Valsen rose up from the landing pad's surface, then shot off into the atmosphere, leaving Corbin and the Academy behind. Now this last step was Bane taking the Darth title, an action that can only be seen as a direct challenge to Lord Khan's rule. To revive that title and the meaning of superiority it invokes, spits at everything the Brotherhood of Darkness stands for. But regardless, whatever else happens, the Sith, the Jedi, and the galaxy will now have to grapple with Darth Bane, Dark Lord of the Sith. Now, of course, Bane goes on to create the Rule of Two and change the history of the Sith, or the future of the Sith, really. I would say the main problem with the Sith was the infighting. Of course, they all came together and eventually you know, they hated Jedi at the end of the day, but amongst themselves, there were tiers and classes, just like with Jedi, but it was more of a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Sith fought other Sith the same way nomads would for respect and ranking, just as we saw here with Bane and Cordis. I also like the fact that this book really explains why the title of Darth wasn't used very much. And by Bane taking that title, it means he doesn't care if it promotes rivalry among the Sith or whatever people think. He wanted to use the title for himself to stand out from everyone else who just called themselves Dark Lords. I like Bane. I like his methodology and the way that he's just overall badass. He does what he wants and he stands up to those who will defy him. Don't get me wrong, he's a Sith, but he's pretty cool. Hope someday we'll get a show just about him. Hey guys, how's it going? Today we're going to go over an excerpt from Drew Karpshin's Darth Bane novel. Now this book is one of my favorite Star Wars books to ever exist. I'd say this and the Plagueis novel are probably my top two of all time. Now this book in general gives us an entire backstory on Darth Bane himself. From the beginning of his life to, well, the end of this novel, which isn't the end of his life, but to where, and spoilers, where he gets an apprentice of his own, Darth Xana, or also known as Rain. Now, throughout this novel, Bane is extremely gifted. He is unbelievably talented and powerful, but he's not as experienced of a fighter or force user as many others. In fact, he didn't even know what the force was. He was just kind of stumbling upon it one day. He just kind of used it his whole life, but he didn't know what this really was, what this gift was. So fast forward pretty much all to near the end of the novel. There are these guys called the Brotherhood of Darkness, and these are the Sith. These are the bad guys, so to speak, from a certain point of view, of course. And the Brotherhood of Darkness was led by a guy named Khan. Now, Khan felt like he was the bee's knees. He felt like the Brotherhood of Darkness need to stick together. No one uses the title Darth because you are part of his Brotherhood of Darkness, and to use the title Darth would be an extreme insult. Not only that, using the title Darth is very dangerous because you are then on your own, and you're not part of the Brotherhood of Darkness. And dangerous, mind you, not just for the one who claimed to be Darth, but also for the Brotherhood of Darkness. Because usually, the Darth was much more powerful and wasn't confined within the Brotherhood of Darkness's rules or what they know or what they don't know. So Bane proclaims himself the title Darth, essentially insulting Khan and completely segregating himself from the Brotherhood of Darkness and saying, you know what, this crap isn't for me. I don't need to do this. I'm a Darth. I'm going to show you guys. Now, a planet that Bane had researched in the archives revealed that it was very full of dark side energy. So Bane headed to it, uh, landing on this unknown world. He was quickly attacked by a Rancor. 
Now, instead of killing the Rancor, he actually used beast control, mind control, kind of like Anakin does with the Reek in Star Wars Episode II, Attack of the Clones on the Battle of Genosis, where he controls it and he actually starts to ride it. So he made his way over to the temple, an extremely ancient temple, a temple that belonged to the long extinct but powerful and technologically advanced Rakata species. Now you guys might remember me talking about the Rakata species in different comic series and also when The Mandalorian Season 2 came out, I briefly did touch on them. When Mando took Rogu to the Seeing Stone on Tython, that's when I knew they're really starting to incorporate the old lore of the Tho-Yor on Tython. And if you don't know the story, essentially the Tho-Yor, there were seven of them, and they all went to different parts of the galaxy. They invited different kinds of species and civilizations on board, and then they all collectively came together on Tython, deposited the species of people, deposited all of them on different parts of of the planet, and eventually only the ones that were force sensitive were allowed to stay on the planet and then the rest of them were exiled. Now then later on the Rakata came in and so on and so forth, but they were this very technologically advanced organic technology then they were extremely ruthless and mean, frankly. Anyway, so this temple belonged to the Rakata. So Bane walks in, and I'm not gonna you know, recite the whole book for you, I want you guys to read it yourselves, but I will recite the part where he does see Revan's holocron, and he learns what the title of Darth is. And this is really where in the book he starts to take the title Darth and he just really runs with it. So he asks himself, you know, could this possibly predate even the holocrons of the ancient Sith? Is this a relic of the Rakata themselves? Asking himself things like, could the guardians of the holocron be imprinted personalities of alien masters from a time even before the birth of the Republic? And if so, could they teach me the secrets? Would they even respond to me? So he moved carefully, Setting the holocron on the floor, he then sat down in front of it, crossed his legs, and began the deep, slow breathing of a meditative process, a meditative trance. He gathered and focused his energy, and he projected a wave of dark side energy to go over the holocron on the floor. And this is when the holocron begins to sparkle, shimmer, in response to this dark side energy that's flowing through it. Bane holds his breath in anticipation, unsure what would come next. A small beam of light projected out from the top. The particles scattered and diffused. They began to shift and spin, coalescing into a cloaked figure, its features completely hidden by the hood of its heavy robe. So this right here is Darth Revan. This is an ancient holocron of him speaking. And this is what he says, as a deep voice, crisp and clear, broke out. I am Darth Revan, Dark Lord of the Sith. The empty halls of the temple above trembled with the reverberations of Bane's triumphant, booming laughter. Now, Bane's laughing because he's thinking, well, you know, I've pretty much learned all of the temple's teachings in a single holocron. So as he continued to listen to this holocron, to what Revan was saying about the ancient Sith and the rituals and so on and so forth, he started to really understand what he just stumbled across. The amount of potential that he was sitting in front of. And he came to learn that even some of the rituals were so freaking dangerous, even for a true Sith Master, that he doubted that he would even dare to use them. And this is Bane. Bane was extremely gifted and extremely powerful. You know that saying, you know, t uh, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard? Bane was the talent and he was the hard work. Then the book goes on to say, And there was far more than just the ancient practices of dark side sorcerers stored inside the holocron. In only a few short weeks, he'd learned more about the true nature of the dark side than he had all of his time on Corbin. Revan had been a true Sith Lord, unlike the simpering masters who bowed to Khan and his brotherhood. And soon, all his knowledge, his understanding of the dark side, would belong to Bane. And so this is really where Bane starts to transcend his learnings and his findings. And this is something the Brotherhood of Darkness would never have done. Any member of the Brotherhood wouldn't go off on some unknown planet to some unknown temple by the Rakata and learn from the holocron that Darth Revan is just inside and explaining all of these ancient and dangerous Sith rituals and different kinds of powers that you can manifest if you study them by knowing these kind of things. So this is like basically stumbling upon the restricted section that Anakin wanted access to so that he could save Padme from dying. And yeah, that's partially one of the reasons why he wanted to become a master was to have access to that section because sadly, that section is only granted to those with the rank of master. 
This is also kind of like the restricted section in Harry Potter when Harry goes down there in the first movie. Now, something else beyond just learning new techniques and things like that for Bane here is that he also learned the fundamentals of creating a Sith Order. If you're going to learn it from anybody, you learn it from Revan. And so really, theoretically, I guess we could even say that Revan at one point was a master of Darth Bane. Just, you know, it wasn't reciprocated, of course, because Revan was dead. He was just a holocron at that point. So essentially, Bane's order was created and molded from Revan's Sith past, from a forgotten past. And this transcends all the way towards Palpatine because Bane's Rule of Two, while it is said as Bane's Rule of Two, but it really came from Revan. This is where he got it from, from this holocron right here. And so, even with all of these things that Bane learned, he eventually was bested, he eventually did die in the end. So of course, the Sith aren't immortal, unless of course you're Darth Sion, that's a totally different freak. But, what I am trying to say is that the Rule of Two began and started with Revan. It got broken up in between somewhere there and, you know, Khan's Brotherhood of Darkness junk flowed in and messed everything up. Not really messed everything up, but it just wasn't the true form of the Sith. It didn't allow the Sith to be as powerful as they could be like what Bane is doing here. It's almost kind of like the Brotherhood of Darkness is very similar to the Jedi Order. They have all these rules, they are so confined within their own laws that they create within their own minds, and it really in the end is doing lesser for the galaxy because they're just confining their true potential. And I think this is something that Anakin always saw and was kind of confused about or frustrated with, is that not only are they holding me back, but they're also just confining themselves to these ridiculous dogmatic laws. And once Palpatine starts to, you know, kind of get into his head a little bit, uh, it's just game over at that point, because he's just a slippery slope going with what Anakin already thinks and perceives about the Jedi Order. So... I can really understand a lot of the points of views of the so-called villainous characters. Now, mind you, the things Anakin did were disgusting and terrible, but what he had to do was do those things so that he could learn the power to save Padme, and that was the whole point of it. He didn't want to do any of those things. Palpatine said in Revenge of the Sith, only then will he be strong enough in the dark side. Do what must be done. Do not hesitate show no mercy, and only then will you be able to save the one that you love. So, for Anakin, he didn't really have much choice. Well, of course he did have a choice, actually. We all have choices, but he was just making a deal with the wrong guy, and he was put into a corner, and I, you know, I can't really blame him. The Jedi didn't really give him much of a chance. It was just year after year after year of Anakin just completely being ignored. Anyways, I've been over that in, de in many different videos. But what I wanted to make clear today and to talk about today a little bit is this Darth Bane novel, the first one. It's fantastic. I and mean, the other two are great too, but this one is really amazing, especially the end with the thought bomb and everything like that and how it's described and depicted and the imagery used when the thought bomb goes off and all of the Sith and all of the Jedi are just killed and their force essence or their spirits are sort of trapped in their screams in this place and it's in this tomb and it's kind of unfortunate that githany died too but i feel like her and bane could have been pretty good together but anyways is what it is hope you guys enjoyed this video let me know what you think about bane learning from darth revan and how the rule of two really fundamentally comes from revan himself well i guess brought back by bane but you know originally from revan Hope you guys enjoyed this one. Leave a like if you did. Check me out on Spotify, Apple iTunes, and Amazon. And of course, on StarWarsTheory.com. I will see you all in the next video. Thank you for your time and for watching wherever you are in the galaxy listening to this right now. The Jedi Prophecy of the Chosen One foretells of a singular being who will bring balance to the Force by destroying the Sith. The Sith Prophecy of the Sithari foretells of a singular perfect being who will lead the Sith, then destroy them but in doing so, make the Sith more powerful than ever before. The two prophecies are clearly similar, but also connected. Now I'm gonna get to that later. As some of you are aware, I'm reading the novel Darth Bane, Path of Destruction, which deals very specifically with the prophecy of the Sithari. The Sith Academy on Korriban, where Bane is training to become a Sith Lord in Lord Khan's Brotherhood of Darkness, has a Zabrak student named Sirak. 
He is levels above more powerful than any of the other Dark Lords in training, including Bane, for the moment at least. Now, the future creator of the Rule of Two has recently murdered a fellow student in the practice ring, but instead of being punished for it, as Bane expected to be, the head of the academy, Lord Cordis, is pleased because Bane showed great strength in how he executed his rival, a Makurth Sith named Foharg. As he prepares to leave Cordis's dwellings, Bane stops and asks the Sith Lord about the Sith prophecy and whether or not the immensely powerful Sirak could indeed be the perfect being, the, the Sithari. What is the Sithari? He blurted out. Cordis tilted his head to the side. Where did you hear that word? His voice was grave. I, I've heard some of the other students use it. About Sirak, they say he could be the Sithari. Some of the old texts speak of the Sithari, Cordis answered slowly, gesturing with a ring-laden claw at the books scattered about the room. They say the Sith will one day be led by a perfect being, one who embodies the dark side and all we stand for. Sirak is this perfect being? Cordis shrugged. Sirak is the strongest student at the academy, for now. Perhaps, in time he will surpass Kasim, and me, and all the other Sith Lords. Perhaps not. He paused. Many of the Masters do not believe in the legend of the Sithari. He continued after a moment. Lord Khan discounts it, for one. It goes against the philosophy underlying the Brotherhood of Darkness. What about you, Master? Do you believe in the legend? Bane waited while Cordis considered his reply. It felt like forever. These are dangerous questions to ask. The Dark Lord finally said, But if the Sithari is more than a legend, he will not simply be born as the exemplar of all our teachings. He, or she, must be forged in the crucibles of trial and battle to attain such perfection. Some might argue such training is the purpose of this academy, but I would counter by insisting that we train our apprentices to join the ranks of the Sith Lords so that they may stand alongside Khan and the rest of the Brotherhood. Realizing that this was as good an answer as he was going to get, Bane nodded and left. He had been absolved of his crime, given a pardon because of his power and potential. He should have been exultant, triumphant, but for some reason, all he could think about as he headed up to the roof to join the other students was the sticky gurgles of Foharg's dying breaths. Sirak, I think it's safe to say, does not turn out to be the Sithari but Bane might be this perfect being. He will go through trials and tribulations and battles, and eventually destroy the Sith only to rebuild them stronger than ever with his new Sith Order, an order that will last a thousand years, leading to Sidious and Vader, the Chosen One. So that's what I meant by there is a connection. If Bane was the Sithari, let's say, then his Sith Order goes from the Sithari to the Chosen One. Beings with one prophesied being and ends with the other. Though there is still a part of me, as I think I've mentioned before, that wonders if both prophecies are in fact the same. Meaning that perhaps Anakin Skywalker is the Chosen One and the Sithari. Hear me out. I mean, he's always the Chosen One because he turns back to the light, but what about that time in between? where he's fully in the dark and he's Darth Vader. And George Lucas has admitted that he is still the Chosen One, even when he's evil. So could this also be reversed and meant that he could be the Chosen One for the Sith as well? Even though he does in the end turn to the light, he spends more time in the dark side and he does many terrible things that advance the Sith teachings tenfold compared to the Jedi. In fact, he was single-handedly responsible for eradicating the Jedi. He allowed Order 66 to take place. He facilitated in the defeat of the Jedi Temple. He hunted the Jedi for years throughout the galaxy, in Anakin Skywalker's body, as Vader, all the way up until his son sacrificed himself for his father, which brought Anakin Skywalker outside of Vader. Now, George Lucas has always said that Anakin Skywalker is the Chosen One, and he always was the Chosen one, even when he was in the dark side. Star Wars has always been about him, at least the first six movies, the George Lucas saga. Many think that Luke ends up being the chosen one, and I know this is actually alluded to at the end of Rebels. However, Lucas has always said that Anakin was the chosen one, and Luke was merely just the catalyst to bring the chosen one back to fulfill the prophecy full swing. Now, where I could see some people having trouble with this theory of Anakin or Vader possibly being the chosen one for the Sith as well, is that he doesn't really have any hold over Sith. He was never really in charge of them. Sidious was, which probably means that the Sithari was indeed Darth Bane. That being said, it definitely makes you think, what if Anakin didn't burn up? 
What if he didn't lose to Obi-Wan? What if he didn't let his arrogance get the best of him during that battle? Because I truly do believe that it was Anakin's arrogance that made him lose to Obi-Wan. I think that if it was on a level field, Anakin would have won, eventually. Obi-Wan was much older, and yes, he was the master of Sorsu, which is the master of defense, but Anakin's powers were growing by the minute. His tapping into the dark side was giving him new powers that Anakin had never known, and these were new techniques that Obi-Wan wasn't used to when he was fighting Anakin and expecting to get the same sort of combat that they had always trained with. So if Anakin hadn't burned and had gone to his full potential, then I think he would have been the chosen one for the Sith. I think he would have then been the true Sithari, and not Bane, let's say. Let's say Anakin did fulfill what he said to Padme, which was to overthrow the Emperor and to kill him. Sidious knew it was coming, and he expected it. He even admitted it to Yoda that Anakin will become more powerful than either of us. But, of course, once he lost to Obi-Wan, George Lucas said that he only became 80% as strong as the Emperor's full potential, which is still extremely strong, but not quite a hundred, or even a hundred and one to beat him. That and the fact that Sidious made his suit very vulnerable to electricity kept Vader as his obedient slave and dog up until Vader's death, Anakin's rebirth, and then Anakin's death fulfilling the prophecy. Hope you enjoyed this video, hope it gave you some backstory on Bane, and it made you think a little bit on the Sithari and the Chosen One, and Anakin's role in all of this just for some fun. Welcome everyone. It's become a meme now, and part of internet culture, but one of the most iconic scenes in a film full of iconic scenes in The Matrix is when Neo is offered the blue pill and red pills. One to remain in the illusion, and the other to wake to the horrific reality of being a flesh and blood battery for giant machines. Everyone has a bad day once in a while, right? But the reason I bring this up is because I've been going through the old Legends materials as of lately, and I started reading the Star Wars book Darth Bane, Path of Destruction by Drew Karpishin. It's the first book in the Darth Bane trilogy, which I might start going over with you guys. But in the story, which follows how a Cortosis miner named Dessel rose to become Darth Bane, the originator of the Rule of Two, there is a moment where the future Sith Lord faces a very similar choice to Neo. His decision would affect the galaxy for the next thousand years, and possibly beyond. Dessel had left the life of a miner, and joined the ranks of the Sith army as a sergeant. After an incident with his squad, the Gloomwalkers, he has come to the attention of the Sith Lords in the Brotherhood of Darkness, which are waging a war across the galaxy with the Jedi's army of light. One of these Sith, a Twi'lek named Kopex, offers two paths forward for the young Dessel. Here, we learn how Dessel, or Des decided to become a Sith and took the derogatory term that his abusive father had always called him in disgust, as his Sith name of Bane. And what do you know of the Jedi? I know they believe themselves to be guardians of the Republic, Des replied, making no attempt to hide his contempt. I know they wield great influence in the Senate. I know many believe they have mystical powers. And the Brotherhood of Darkness? Des considered his words more carefully this time. You are the leaders of our army and the sworn enemy of the Jedi. Many believe that you, like them, have unnatural abilities, but you do not. Des hesitated, struggling to come up with the answer he thought Kopex wanted to hear. In the end, he couldn't figure out what his Inquisitor was looking for, so he simply told the truth. I believe most of the stories are greatly exaggerated. Kopex nodded, a common enough belief. Those who do not understand the ways of the Force regard such tales as myth or legend, but the Force is real, and those who wield it have power you can't even imagine. You have seen many battles, but you have not experienced the real war. While troops vie for control of worlds and moons, the Jedi and Sith Masters seek to destroy each other. We are being driven toward an inevitable and final confrontation. The faction that survives, Sith or Jedi, will determine the fate of the galaxy for the next thousand years. True victory in this war will not come through armies, but through the Brotherhood of Darkness. Our greatest weapon is the Force, and those individuals who have the power to command it. Individuals like you. He paused to let his words sink in before continuing. You are special, Des. You have many remarkable talents. These talents are manifestations of the Force, and they have served you well as a soldier. But you have only scratched the surface of your gift. The Force is real. It exists all around us. You can feel the power of it in this room. Can you sense it? Des hesitates only a moment before nodding. I feel it, hot, like a fire waiting to explode. Now this is a part that I really enjoy because you know, we see the Force used in both the light and the dark, and sometimes in between, like in the sequels, but what we never really get to understand is exactly how it feels. And one thing I really appreciate about this excerpt here is that you get to see, or actually you get to kind of feel, 
how the force or the dark side feels for someone who has a lot of it. I feel it hot, like a fire waiting to explode. So it's like this pent up aggression and emotion that's waiting to just ignite or be ignited and blow up at whatever is around him or whatever it's directed to. And I think the Sith had a major problem with uh, the ability to maybe control their anger, because if they did, they'd be more like a sniper shot versus just a shotgun. Both equally powerful maybe, but one is more directed, whereas the other one has no direction. And I think this really separates the differences between regular Sith and those who are more powerful, like Sidious, for example. The power of the dark side, the heat of passion and emotion. I can feel it in you as well. Burning beneath the surface, burning like your anger, it makes you strong. Kopex closed his eyes and tilted his head back, as if basking in the heat. The tips of his head tails twitched ever so slightly. The only sound was the faint crackle of flame from the torches. A bead of sweat rolled down the crown of Des's bare scalp and along the back of his neck. He didn't wipe it away, though he did shift his feet uncomfortably as it trickled its way between his shoulder blades. The slight movement seemed to snap the Twi'lek out of his trance. He didn't speak again for several seconds, but he studied Des intently with his piercing gaze. You have touched the Force in the past, but your abilities are an insignificant speck beside the power of a true Sith Master, he finally said. There is great potential in you. If you stay here in Korriban, we can teach you to unleash it. Dez was speechless. You would no longer be a trooper on the front lines, Kopex continued. If you accept my offer, that part of your life is over. You will be trained in the ways of the dark side. You will become one of the Brotherhood of Darkness, and you will not return to the Gloom Walkers. Dez felt his heart pounding, his head swimming. As long as he could remember, He'd known he was special because of his unique talents, and now he was being told that his abilities were nothing compared with what he could really accomplish. Still, part of him balked at the idea of leaving his unit without even having a chance to say goodbye. He considered Adnar, Lucia, and the others as more than just fellow soldiers. They were his friends. Could he really abandon them like this, even for the chance to join the Sith Masters? He recalled one of the last things Groshik had ever said to him. Don't count on others for help. In the end, each of us is in this alone. The survivors are those who know how to look out for themselves. Everything he'd had, he'd given to his unit. He'd saved their lives too many times to count, and in the end, when the enforcers had come to take him away, they'd been powerless to save him. They would have tried if he'd let them, but they would have failed. Des realized the truth. His unit, his friends, could do nothing for him now. He could rely only on himself, like always. He'd be a fool to turn this opportunity down. I am honored. Master Kopex, and I gratefully accept your offer. The way of the Sith is not for the weak, the big Twi'lek warned. Those who falter will be left behind. There was something ominous in his tone. I won't be left behind, Des replied. Unfazed, that remains to be seen, Kopex noted. Then he added, this is a new beginning for you, Des, a new life. Many of the students who come here take a new name for themselves. They leave their old life behind. Des had no desire to hang on to any parts of his old life. An abusive father, the brutality of working the mines on Apatros. He had been seeking a new life for as long as he could remember. The Gloomwalkers had offered an escape, but it had been a temporary one. Now he had a chance to leave his past behind forever. All he had to do was embrace the Brotherhood of Darkness and its teachings. And yet, for reasons he couldn't explain, he felt the cold grip of fear closing in on him. The fear made him hesitate. Do you wish to choose a new name for yourself, Des? Kopex asked, possibly sensing his reluctance. Do you wish to be reborn? Des nodded. Kopex smiled once more. And by what name shall we call you now? The fear would not stop him. He would seize the fear, transform it, and make it his own. He would take what had once made him weak and use it to make himself strong. My name is Bane. Bane of the Sith. And here we go. That's how the first Lord of the Order of Two became a Sith, very different from the violent and desperate method that turned the last member of their order, Darth Vader. What Kopex and the rest of the Brotherhood don't realize is that it's not the Jedi that will destroy them, but their newest recruit, Bane, though at this point, Bane doesn't even realize that. Now one thing with the Sith at this time period is that there were so many of them, and they would all kind of just have a civil war between each other. Many of them would kill each other for no real reason, and this is something that Bane saw and he thought he could do better. But Bane chose to leave this life behind, just like Neo did. Unlike Neo, though, what he left behind would probably have been the only life that would ever have given Bane happiness. He was abused in the mines. The Sith will make him a monster, but his unit, the Gloomwalkers, will be the only moment in Bane's life that he will ever have a family and camaraderie. 
There is a timeline out there where he went back to them instead of going to Corbin where he took the blue pill. In that world, I see him having a successful military career and retired to a nice planet to raise a family and enjoy life with his friends. Or maybe he would have just died in some battlefield somewhere. There is that possibility too. But he would have died a man surrounded by comrades, not minions. That's a fan fiction for a different time and it's also something that Anakin hypothesizes for himself or theorizes for himself, I should say, in a video that I've done in the past where he thinks, what if Qui-Gon never found him? And in that little fan fiction, if you don't remember the video or if you haven't seen it, Anakin realizes that he would have become an amazing pilot, the best pilot in the galaxy, and he would have made millions and billions of credits and become extremely rich with his aptitude for flying and racing. Hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know if you want me to cover more stuff from Legends and from the Bane trilogy. I think they're really interesting books. And it's refreshing to get some kind of a different character going on. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another top 10 video. Now, one of the most enigmatic characters in Star Wars, hero and villain alike, is Revan. He was one of the most powerful and influential beings in galactic history and a true champion of both the light and dark sides of the Force. Let's start off with number one, the military genius, a master tactician. Revan was the supreme commander of Jedi and Republic forces in the Mandalorian Wars and often surprised his enemies with his unorthodox and effective maneuvers and strategies. The Mandalorian warrior clans whose conquest and enslavement of the galaxy was halted by Revan's entrance into the war lost many of their forces to Revan but still held their greatest enemy in high regards because of what a fierce warrior he was and due to his incredible talent for warfare. But as ruthless as the Mandalorians could get, which is pretty ruthless, even they could not have prepared for how far Revan could go. The Jedi leader in the final battle of the war activated an ancient device called the Shadow Generator on Malachor V and sacrificed an immense number of not just Mandalorians, but Revan's own troops as well annihilating his enemies for good with the superweapon. However, at the same time, it also corrupted all the Jedi under his command, except for one of his generals, Mitra Surik, who managed to cut herself off from the Force temporarily to avoid falling to the dark side. Number 2. HK-47 Shortly after the end of the Mandalorian War, the now self-proclaimed Darth Revan constructed a hunter-killer assassin droid named HK-47. The aggressive droid was originally used to carry out assassination missions for the Dark Lord. Much to Revan's amusement, the killer droid referred to organic beings as meat bags. But like his master, the droid would get its memory erased and coincidentally end up joining up with the mind-wiped Revan, who is now working for the Jedi. The droid hated all living things, with perhaps the only exception being Revan himself. HK-47 often eagerly suggested murder as a solution to most of the problems the reformed Revan and his allies encountered during their travels in the Jedi Civil War. The droid survived for thousands of years by transferring his personality into a ship's computer. When later the ship crashed on the volcanic world of Mustafar, HK-47 soon found a new droid body and began to amass an army of droids to kill every meat bag on the planet. The droid and his army was, in the end, defeated. However, in the end, HK-47 did manage to escape and remains at large somewhere out there in the galaxy. Number 3. Revan's son. After Revan's redemption and defeat of Darth Malak, he married the Jedi Bastila Shan, and together the two of them had a son named Venera Shan. Unfortunately, Revan disappeared on a mission to the Unknown Regions when Bastila was still pregnant with him. So his son, Venera, whose first name was an anagram of his father's, never met his father, though they looked alike, with the same eyes, fair skin, and shoulder-length dark brown hair. However, surprisingly, as the child of two of the most powerful Jedi in history, he wasn't force sensitive and therefore never joined the Jedi Order, or for that matter, the Sith. Instead, Venner served as a politician in the Republic and eventually rose to the position of Supreme Chancellor. Number 4. Centuries of Imprisonment After the Mandalorian War and the preceding Jedi Civil War that ended with Revan's redemption and return to the light, he and his former general, Mitra Surik, went into the unknown regions to confront and destroy the immortal Sith Emperor Vitiate on his empire's capital world of Dromund Kaas. Though he and his allies fought fiercely, a last minute betrayal led to Revan's defeat. Mitra was killed and Revan held prisoner in a stasis for 300 years, where the Sith Emperor tortured him through the Force as he tried to invade Revan's mind and get him to reveal the strengths and weaknesses of the Republic and 
the Jedi Order. However, perhaps Revan's greatest strength was his mind, so he not only managed to resist the endless torment and telepathic attacks, but was also able to fight back by using his will to subtly influence the Emperor, augmenting the Immortal's fear of death and causing him to postpone his planned invasion of the Republic for three centuries. Number 5. Dark Side Rituals While being tortured through the centuries, Revan was able to glimpse many secrets of the Force from his torturer, Vitiate, without the powerful Sith Emperor being aware of what he was accumulating from his mind. This included the ritual of Nathema, perhaps the most complex and elaborate Sith ritual ever conceived. Whether Revan had known of the ritual but forgotten about it later, or after the Jedi mind wiped him, is unclear. He could have learned of the ritual beforehand when he and Malak had come under the Sith Emperor's influence before the Jedi Civil War. What is known is that he recorded a transcript of the ritual into his Sith holocron, which thousands of years later was rediscovered by the forefather of the Rule of Two. Darth Bane. It was an ability Vitiate had used to drain the life force of 8,000 Sith Lords and almost all other life on the planet of Nathema. This was to augment his strength in the force and to make him immortal. Now I know there are a lot of Vitiate fans in the comments so let me know if you think Vitiate could take on Sidious in an all out brawl. Or maybe if you want that animated. Anyways, using what he had assimilated from the ritual, Revan was able to come with his own right, the Thought Bomb, a force nexus capable of absorbing the soul of any force sensitive being caught within its radius, and doing so by catching it in a swirling vortex of never ending pain and torment for all eternity. Sounds great, I know. A ritual again Darth Bane learned of from Revan's holocron centuries later and would use to annihilate thousands of Jedi and eliminate every Sith except himself during the war between the army of light and the brotherhood of darkness on the planet Rusan. Number 6. Aid from a Dead Friend Though Revan was still strong, he could not have fought off the Sith Emperor's assault through the centuries without the aid of Mitra Surik, the Jedi General's Force Ghost remaining at Revan's side throughout his time in stasis. She allowed him to feed off her essence so her sustenance could strengthen his resolve. Whenever Vichyate's torture became too much and weakened him, her spirit continued to refresh and restore Revan, allowing the powerful force user to carry on in his perpetual war of wills with the Sith Emperor. Number 7. Two Revans Growing frustrated with Revan's ability to resist him, Vitiate and six powerful Sith Lords who served as the Emperor's advisors, known as the Dreadmasters, decided to concentrate on splitting Revan's dark and light sides apart into two different personalities. The Jedi had created the dual personalities when they wiped his mind back during the Jedi Civil War. So Vitiate reasoned that the two personalities were working separately one for the dark and one for the light side, and this would weaken Revan's resolve in general, as with a united personality he had proven too strong to break. The attempt was only partially successful because the Sith Emperor was never able to actually finalize the split before Revan finally managed to escape from his 300 year ordeal. Number 8. Revan, the Genocidal Maniac When Revan was finally freed by Republic forces, the Sith Emperor's attempts at splitting his mind apart had made the brilliant strategist deranged and vindictive. So using an army of droids created by the Foundry, a massive manufacturing facility built into an asteroid by the Rakata thousands of years prior, Revan intended to commit genocide on the Sith, as vengeance for the torment he'd had to endure for so long. But before he could carry out his plans, the great hero and villain villain was ultimately killed by an Imperial strike team. Though, as with most things involving Revan, from there, things just got more complicated. Number 9. Revan Resurrected Revan physically died, but the dark side version of himself refused to become one with the Force, and so the personality split finally became complete. Though perhaps not how Vitiate had envisioned it, Revan was split, literally. The dark side persona existed physically in his reanimated body, while the light Revan existed as a force ghost. So, body and soul were split, the dark side Revan continued with his plans against the Sith Emperor, taking control of a secret cult that had sprung up within the Empire that was devoted to him. These were known as the Revanites, and intended to use them to eliminate Vitiate and remake the Republic, while his light side spirit believed that he should have died long ago and become one with the Force. Number 10. Final Defeat 
The Dark Revan decided that he would use the Sith Emperor's own ritual of Nathema to destroy him personally. So, he attempted to enact the ceremony on Yavin 4 to battle Vitiate. But again, his plans were disturbed by a group of adventurers. This time, a coalition between Republic and Imperial forces, who saw Revan as a threat to both their sides of the galactic conflict. Revan retreated into Yavin's jungles to an ancient temple known as the Forgotten Terrace. But when yet another strike team came after him, led by the galactic hero known as the Outlander, the Dark Revan once again held his own against their forces. Whenever he would defeat one of the warriors, Revan's light side spirit would shield the Outlander and resurrect the Fallen. The spirit also raised the strike team to higher levels, as they fought across three levels of terrain against his physical evil half. But ultimately, with the strike team and Revan's light side ghost, the Dark Revan was defeated permanently, and the two halves of Revan were once again reunited and in peace, becoming one with the Force again. The Outlander and the Strike Team knew they had barely survived the encounter. Hope you guys enjoyed this video about Revan, top 10 facts about his story, and I can also make a top 10 about his powers, which is pretty interesting as well. Hey everyone, hope you're having a nice day so far today. So, there once lived a powerful Dark Lord of the Sith, clad in a terror-inducing black mask, who commanded great armies and struck fear into his enemies through his immense prowess with the dark side of the force, and nearly unrivaled lightsaber skills. And no, I'm not talking about the one with the respirator issues. This Sith ruled thousands upon thousands of years before A New Hope. He was called the Lord of Hate and Master of the Gathering Darkness. His name was Tulak Horde, one of the most powerful Sith Lords of all time. Some would even argue he was the most powerful Sith to have ever lived. Regardless, powerful he was. From early on, Tulak Horde demonstrated a great proficiency with the dark side, as he quickly rose through the ranks of the early Sith Empire, striking fear in his rivals with his mastery in the art of lightsaber combat, telekinesis, and manipulation of the Force. In his youth, he fought an honorable duel against a large reptilian humanoid assassin named Chem Dval who was a Dashade, a tough and ferocious species that were notable for their partial resistance to the Force. Winning the duel, he did something very uncharacteristic for a Sith. He sparred the Dashade, turning Chemval into the most faithful ally that he could find. Soon after, with his massive followers, Tulak Horde led a campaign of terror-crushing militants on the planets Yin and Kabash, who had rebelled against the Sith. During the campaign, however, another Sith named Alosius Kalig approached Tulak about serving him, but Tulak did not think much of Aloysius and dismissed him quickly. Not accepting the refusal, though, Aloysius challenged Tulak's greatest general to prove himself, and he won. Impressed by his victory, Tulak accepted Aloysius as his new general, placing him in charge of many of his troops, which he would lead to numerous victories in Tulak's name. During these battles, Tulak Horde would utilize his knowledge of Sith rituals to drain and feed off the strength of his opponents. Undefeated and slaughtering all who dared to oppose him, Tulak Horde finally earned the title of Dark Lord of the Sith. Discovering and subjugating the Dromun system, Tulak was believed to have conquered over a hundred worlds for the Sith Empire. However, even though as his general, Aloysius' military ingenuity provided the Dark Lord with many great victories, Tulak began to grow apprehensive of his commander, as he feared Aloysius' strength was growing to such a degree that he was becoming a dangerous rival. So. He arranged Aloysius' assassination, and while his body was allowed to be entombed on the Sith planet of Dramund Kas, Aloysius' family still went into hiding to avoid a similar fate. Tulak Horde further continued his studies of Sith sorcery, writing down many tomes containing his vast knowledge of the dark arts, as well as constructing his own Sith holocron. But not wishing for just anyone to discover his secrets, he scattered much of his teachings in hidden and hard locations to reach, in order to make sure that only those worthy would uncover what he knew. It was even rumored that he might have learned the secret to eternal life. The Dark Lord of the Sith had only one apprentice during his life, which is not unusual for a Sith Lord in the Rule of Two, but for the ancient Siths, it was very rare. But for Tulak, only Ortancella proved worthy of his teachings. In appreciation of the honorable relationship he had built with his most trusted ally, the Dashade assassin, Chemval, 
Tulak Horde had his servant and ally placed inside a stasis chamber in suspended animation deep within the future tomb of another great ancient Sith Lord named Negasado. This was all in the Valley of Dark Lords on the Sith planet Korriban. As is the consequence of most Sith masters and apprentice relationships, Orten Chela would betray Tulak Ord not long afterwards by stabbing his master literally in the back. Orten had his own Deshade servant named Veshik Uruk, who he had consumed the dying Sith Lord's force energy. Tulak Ord was then himself entombed within the Valley of Dark Lords, and his writings, Holocron, and Menacing Black Mask were also with him. Many traps were placed to keep looters away and to serve as obstacles to test the worth of any knowledge-seeking Sith who dared to venture inside. As the conclusion of a war fought centuries later between the Republic and the Sith, known as the Great Hyperspace War, Corbin was bombed and much of the histories of Tulak Horde was lost or destroyed in the devastation, though his tomb remained undisturbed, until at an even later date during yet another crisis between the Jedi and the Sith, in what is referred to as the Jedi Civil War, the amnestic Jedi named Revan entered his tomb and confiscated the Dark Lord's so iconic black mask. Know that there once was a Darth Treya, and that she cast aside that role, was exiled, and found a new purpose. But there must always be a Darth Treya, one that holds the knowledge of betrayal, who has been betrayed in their heart, and will betray in turn. Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day today. Today we're going to cover Darth Treya. She's quite an interesting character from Legends, so here we go. Is a lightsaber still a lightsaber if it lost its power? Is a Jedi still a Jedi if she lost her Force powers? These are many of the types of vexing questions were staples for the students who studied under the Jedi Master, known simply as Kreia. While her apprentices were mystified and intrigued by her challenging conundrums, her fellow Jedi viewed them as quaint, but they were far from it. Kreia, as a Jedi historian and master, was in search of deeper truths and encouraged her students to challenge and question their assumptions. Not to rely on what they saw in front of them, but instead what was concealed beneath it. In fact, her own eyesight remained unused and she relied purely on the Force to penetrate the mysteries of the galaxy. Because of her eccentric method of teaching, the Jedi Council were concerned and kept a careful eye on her, but her Jedi trainees admired her philosophy, especially one Padawan who was particularly gifted, known only as Revan. He would leave her tutelage, but only because he wanted to round out his education by learning about the Force from the perspective of the other masters in the Order. Eventually, he would return to her for guidance when he found himself at odds with the Jedi Council concerning their inaction against the Mandalorian Neo-Crusaders, who were waging a war on the Republic across the galaxy. Revan would decide to defy the Council and to go to war with the Mandalorians. Many other Jedi joined him in his crusade. In fact, all the Jedi that had been Kreia's students went with him to defend the Republic. The brutal war would lead to Revan and many of his followers turning to the dark side. Those who did not turn simply abandoned their training. Now as a consequence, the Jedi considered all of Kreia's pupils to be failures and denounced her and her teachings. Thus, she was exiled from the Order. After her expulsion from the Jedi Order, Kreia wanted to know more about what had led to Revan's fall. So, she traced the path he had taken during the war and ultimately felt herself being drawn to the Sith world of Malachor V. Now this planet was a nexus for the dark side and had once been a part of the ancient Sith Empire. So once she arrived, she found the Treyas Academy, an age old dark side praxium that had served as Darth Revan's stronghold. When she entered, she was confronted by Sith assassins left behind by Revan. But surprisingly enough, instead of attacking the old Jedi, they instead showed her manuscripts and tomes containing the most closely guarded and profound secrets of the Sith. The texts could only be read through the Force, and they revealed, as Kreia saw it, the cosmic truths she had strived to comprehend her entire life. Truths that changed and perhaps broke her very sanity. The ancient Sith sorcerers who had authored the texts claimed that they had obtained insight into secret realities beyond ours. The contradictory and aimless nature of existence as understood by most sentient species was a burden to comprehend and an obvious lie. Anyone who was force sensitive. Now the force by its very being revealed there was much more to reality than the apparent and therefore every force sensitive lived in a constant state of betrayal and they were forced to live in a compromised and chaotic universe. They had to 
live a lie and realize it. At first, Correa tried to argue against these revelations, denouncing them as falsehoods, but she came to perceive that her resistance was a self-defense mechanism. She believed every word of the texts, and she knew it. She saw now that Revan had never fallen to the dark side, but that he had met the call for greater actions to be done. With that, the Jedi Master Kreia was no longer. In her place stood Darth Treya, the Lord of Betrayal. She re-established the Treyas Academy so she could create and train an entirely new generation of Sith that would continue what Darth Revan had started. Revealing herself as Revan's former master to what remained of the Dark Lord's forces after their defeat in the Jedi Civil War, the Sith troopers pledged to follow her. Having secured a military force, Darth Treya felt within the dark side, certain force wounds that called for her. Following where they led, she eventually encountered two powerful Sith Lords, Darth Sion, the Lord of Pain, and Darth Nihilus, the Lord of Hunger. Both Darksiders were interested in rebuilding the Sith Order and agreed to joining her in forming the Sith Triumvirate, an alliance made up of several, if not hundreds, of Sith apprentices, Sith Masters, and of course, Sith assassins. However, even as Sion and Nihilus had agreed to apprentice themselves to her, their ideals and visions for the Sith did not match Treyas. She wanted to fulfill Revan's vision, while Nihilus wanted to satiate his hunger and Sion was becoming more obsessive with his crusade against the Jedi. After she had taught Darth Nihilus how to use the dark side to devour entire worlds, the two Siths began to plot against her. So, in the innermost sanctum of the Academy, known as the Treyas Core, they confronted her and stripped her of her connection with the Force. But instead of killing her, they decided it would be crueler to let her live, exiled once more. After casting her aside, Darth Nihilus took her place as the Dark Lord of the Sith, and both he and Sion began their Jedi assassination campaign. It was so effective that most of the Jedi were wiped out and those few who weren't went into hiding. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Essentially, they left no Jedi alive in the galaxy, at least from what they knew. While the two Sith were busy with their Jedi Purge, their former master had assumed her name of Kreia and left Malachor V, searching for another Jedi exile named Mitra Surik. Now, Mitra Surik was one of her former Jedi students and had served as a general under Revan when he was still a Jedi. This was all during the Mandalorian Wars. Now, she had been instrumental in defeating the Mandalorians during the final battle of the war, which had taken place at Malachor V, by ordering the activation of the Mass Shadow Generator. Now, this was a devastating super weapon that had crushed both the Republic and Mandalorian forces caught in its destructive wave and left a substantial wound in the Force. The horror of what she had done was so great that it threatened to kill her. So unconsciously, the Jedi General had severed her own connection to the Force, which might have been the only thing that prevented her from falling to the dark side, as had happened to every other Jedi under Revan's command. Kreia wanted to find Mitra because of the Jedi General's unique, innate talent in Force bonding, an ability a Jedi has to form connections through the Force. The stronger the Jedi, the stronger the connection. Kreia intended to help Mitra reconnect with the Force, as the former Dark Lord had discovered a way to deafen the entire galaxy to it, and believed that through Mitra she could create a Force wound greater than any other, a wound that would spread throughout the galaxy and never end, silencing the Force forever. Kreia found the exiled Jedi General unconscious from a drug on a Republic warship. She took the Jedi aboard Revan's former ship, the Ebon Hawk, and barely escaped an ambush by Darth Sion. During this ordeal, both Kreia and Mitra subconsciously reached out to each other, forming a force bond that intertwined their lives. Though they had reached the mining facility, Paragus II, in relative safety, it didn't take long for Sion to catch up to them in the commandeered Republic ship, Harbinger. This was where Kreia came face to face with the former student, since she hadn't seen since he exiled her. They fought, but Kreia was easily defeated, losing her left hand, to Sion's crimson lightsaber. This simultaneously caused Mitra to feel Kreia's pain in her own hand because of their bond. You can see the inspiration here possibly from the whole Rey and Kylo connection. After they had escaped Sion once more, Kreia took the opportunity to convince the Jedi exile that because of their bond, if one of them should die, they both would. This left Mitra no choice but to keep Kreia close to her. As Kreia slowly guided Mitra into reconnecting with the Force, she began to teach the younger woman, 
that the actions of a Jedi should be chosen carefully, and that Mitra should always consider the ethical implications of all quests she undertakes. What is right and moral is not as simple as dividing everything into the light and dark side of the Force. The morale of the inhabitants of the galaxy were more complex than that. What the right thing to do was not always so straightforward. They decided to try and locate the various Jedi Masters that had gone into hiding, in order to see if they could get their aid in stopping the Sith. As Mitra's connection to the Force grew, more and more companions were drawn to her through the Force. Kreia realized it was the younger woman's Force bond ability, transmitting a call of sorts that caused these strangers to bond with her. Through many adventures, they eventually met with the reassembled Jedi Council in the ruins of the Jedi Enclave on Dantooine. But instead of deciding to help Mitra, the Jedi Masters believed that she was a wound in the Force herself, and a danger that could lure the Sith to them. So, they attempted to strip the Force from her, for real this time. However, Freya stormed in, and having herself reconnected to the Force through their long journey, used it to drain the Jedi Masters' connection instead, thereby killing them in the process. She then then assumed her Sith persona again, and was once more Darth Treya. The Sith left Mitra, who was unconscious and shortly afterwards returned to Malachor V. There she planned to sacrifice herself, as her death would open up a large wound that would destroy the Force itself. But before doing so, she decided to wait for Mitra to come for answers and a final confrontation. After confronting and defeating Darth Nihilus, Mitra did indeed follow Treya to Malachor V, though before she could reach her former mentor and ally, the Jedi I first had to deal with Darth Sion, who waited for her within the Treyas Academy. Now, I've made a video on Darth Sion. Uh, he's a pretty cool character. He was pretty much almost immortal, so stay tuned for that one. The problem with confronting Darth Sion was that the Sith Lord was technically already dead. His body was decomposed and a scarred mess. Essentially, he was an undead zombie with a keen mind and a tremendous dark side ability that just grew and grew. It was only the Sith's iron will that kept him alive, much like Darth Maul, but Mitra was able to erode that iron will through their duel, eventually convincing him to give up the pain that was keeping him from dying. As he let go, he told the Jedi General that she had been his weakness, but she was Treya's weakness too. Finding Treya in the Academy's core, Mitra first tried to reason with her former teacher, but to no avail. With no choice, they both clashed in an epic lightsaber duel, but Mitra was in time able to cut off Treya's last remaining hand. The Sith then demanded that Mitra kill her, but the Jedi refused. Angered by her unwillingness, Treya used the Force to control three lightsabers and attack the Jedi with them. But once again, Mitra was able to best Treya, though not without landing a fatal wound on her. Despite being the Lord of Betrayal, Mitra forgave Treya for her deceptions and everything that had happened. She still wanted to try and save her old teacher, but Treya stopped her and told the younger Jedi that she already had. It's kind of like a Luke and Vader moment. And that by killing her, the Jedi had awarded her more than she could possibly know. Treya then admitted that she truly loved Mitra, not just because she considered her her greatest student, but because she didn't believe that she was a true Jedi. Treya then drew upon the force that radiated from Malachor V, and as a last gift to her student, she looked into the future of the galaxy and that of Mitra's friends, telling the Jedi what she saw. Then, she expressed her hope that Mitra would follow Revan into the unknown regions. However, whether she chose to do that or to simply depart the planet and return to her life in the Republic, or even if she was to decide to stay on Malachor V and wait for the other Force sensitives to join her in time, there was no dishonor in any of her two choices. She could even return to her exile, where her Force bond would have no effect on the lives of others. But Mitra chose to follow Revan, and with that, Darth Treya surrendered her life to the Living Force, the mystical energy she had tried to destroy, but now embraced. Now one with the Force, her body was soon enough destroyed when the Mass Shadow Generator was once again activated, resulting in the annihilation of Malachor V. Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day so far today. So during the time of Exar Kun's war against the Jedi, Darth Sion was a human male who served the infamous Dark Lord as one of his Sith marauders. He was strong in the dark side, and a ferocious warrior that had a peculiar mania and disgust towards his own body. He despised the fragile limitations to pain and damage that all humans have, to such a degree that his hate for his perceived weaknesses drove him to fixate entirely on pain. Pain became the source he would draw on the dark side from. Thus, Darth Sion became the Lord of Pain, and went into battle with the Jedi, openly seeking death. Because Sion was such a violent combatant, the death he sought did not come, as he continued to defeat every enemy he encountered. 
Instead, his tolerance towards pain grew and grew, to the point that Sion gradually started to believe that he was immortal. But of course, eventually, he did come across a Jedi able to match his power and was struck down in battle. However, he did come back from the dead. As he lay there, finished on the battlefield, the pain within him only surged to such agonizing extremes that it pushed him to rise again and strike down his very surprised killer. His body was dead, but through his anger and his hate, and most importantly, his constant excruciating pain, the dark side allowed him to hold his decomposing body together. Though from that point on, he always had to concentrate on his rage and never-ending pain to keep going, Sion had in fact become immortal. Exar Kun was eventually defeated and his Sith Empire collapsed, but Sion remained. The Mandalorian forces that had served the Dark Lord would, through the decades following their loss, unite under a new Mandalore, the title was given to the top Mandalorian chieftain, and begin another conquest of the Republic. The warrior clan devastated every world they invaded, until a Jedi named Revan used his power and military genius to lead the Republic to victory, only for him in turn to fall to the dark side and become a new Dark Lord of the Sith. So, the Mandalorian War came to an end, only to be replaced by a new war under a Sith Empire. Pleased with the outcome, Darth Sion joined up with Revan, but like with Exar Kun, this empire was not to last either. As the collapse happened, Sion was on Korriban, at the Sith Academy observing his fellow Sith turn on one another. This was in keeping with Sith nature, but Sion was surprised that it was Revan himself that had betrayed the Sith and destroyed what he had built, when he was redeemed by the light side and was once again a Jedi. Some of those Sith lords that survived either declared themselves warlords over their own smaller territories, or withdrew into the unknown regions, but not Darth Sion. Again, he remained, but he wasn't the only one. A former Jedi Master of Revan's, who had also fallen to the dark side, named Darth Treya, which I'm going to make a video on as well, she was this elder woman, and she was very strong in the Force, and she was searching the galaxy far and wide for what she termed wounds in the Force. That's right, she was looking for wounds in the Force. And Sion was one such wound. She was forming a Sith team, kind of like uh, the Avengers, I guess, but just on the dark side, and she was doing this on the dark side planet of Malachor V, with the aim of eradicating the Jedi once and for all from the galaxy. So Sion joined Darth Treya as her apprentice. He was not alone, however. Another Sith, the Lord of Hunger, Darth Nihilus, became an apprentice of Treya's as well. However, Sion and Nihilus' goals started to differ from those of their master. Furthermore, Sion was becoming frustrated with the abstract approach Treya had to her teachings, and he couldn't stand how her words kept echoing in his head. So the fragile alliance of the Sith Avengers began to fracture. Eventually, Sion and Nihilus then agreed to deal with their master. So together, they confronted her while she was meditating. Sion ruthlessly beat Treya to a pulp, and then Nihilus used his dark side hunger to strip Treya of her connection to the Force. However, they didn't kill her. Instead, she was cast out, and Nihilus became the new Dark Lord. Now, Sion went on a Jedi killing spree across the galaxy. Over the course of his purge, he was killed on several occasions, but, you know, as before, he just kept getting up each time and slaughtered as many Jedi as he could. Now, during this time, he and Nihilus rebuilt the Sith into yet another empire. Once Sion's crusade came to an end, almost every Jedi in the galaxy was extinct. The Jedi Order had publicly disbanded, and whatever Jedi were still alive, had gone underground. However, there was a surviving Jedi Master named Atris, who wanted to bring the Sith into the opening to destroy them, but she needed bait. So she drew in another Jedi, who had remained outside known space since the Mandalorian War. Her name was Mitra Surik, and she had been exiled from the Jedi when she had chosen to join Revan in his war against the Mandalorians. But the Jedi Master was able to get Mitra to return to Republic territory, and once the exiled Jedi Knight did, Atris made sure information of her location reached the Sith. Thinking Mitra must be the last of the Jedi, Sion pursued her. The Jedi exile had returned from the Outer Rim after securing transportation aboard the Republic vessel Harbinger when Sion and his Sith assassins came after her. However, Sion's former master, Darth Treya, now going by the name Kreia, interfered as she came to Mitra's rescue in Revan's former ship, the Ibn Hawk. Sion's warship intercepted Kreia and opened fire on the Hawk, but the freighter managed to send out a distress signal 
and the Harbinger engaged Sion's warship. The Sith Lord allowed the Republic to think they had been defeated, so when they came aboard his vessel, Sion's cloaked Sith assassin sneaked aboard the Republic's ship while Sion played dead. The Republic crew found him, checked to see if he was alive, which he wasn't as he had been dead for years. Thinking the threat was neutralized, the crew brought the body to the medical bay on the Harbinger. But the Republic forces had also rescued Kreia from the damaged Ebon Hawk. As Sion's assassin stealthily began to kill the crew, Sion awoke, killed whoever was around him, and started hunting for Mitra. But Kreia got to her first and escaped, but still functioning Ebon Hawk. As she went into hyperspace before Sion could reach them, the Sith Lord was able to assume control of the Republic vessel. He came right after them to the mining world of Paragus II. Once Sion had docked at the mining faculty and had his assassins watch for his prey, Kreia, Mitra, and a prisoner, they all helped a Jedi coming aboard the Harbinger as they searched for an escape route. But unfortunately for the Jedi's party, Sion intercepted them. However, Kreia leapt at her former student wielding a sword, but she was still deafened to the Force. So Sion cut off her hand, but she managed to escape him and join up with Mitra and Ebon Hawk. Though not giving up, Sion continued to chase after them in the Harbinger. But in the ensuing firefight, the volatile asteroids that orbited Paragus were hit by blaster fire and ignited, consuming the Harbinger in their explosion. But of course, Sion remained. Outraged that Kreia was protecting the exiled Jedi, she was so much weaker than him. Sion became obsessed with annihilating everything his former master had held dear, especially Mitra Surik. So, when some time later the Jedi Knight came to Korriban searching for Lona Vash, a master on the Jedi Council who had been captured by the Sith, Sion was finally getting his opportunity to hurt Kreia. If he could kill the Jedi exile, that is. Sion killed the council member and waited for Mitra. When they finally met face to face, Sion warned the Jedi Knight that Kreia would destroy Mitra as she had destroyed Sion. Then they dueled in a vicious battle and every time the Jedi injured him, the Sith Lord would use his pain and the dark side to restore his health. The dude was pretty much immortal, literally. Realizing it was a battle that she couldn't win, Mitra fled the Sith Academy. Now, Sion did not pursue after her. He felt a measure of respect for her after she fought so well against him, so he let her go. He was certain they would meet again, but soon the respect the Sith Lord had for the Jedi turned to hate once more. He couldn't get her off his mind. As Sion realized that he had been stricken by her beauty and began to have feelings for her that he could not tolerate. That's right, he got the hots for her. Sion returned to Malachor V where he encountered Kreia waiting for him. The Elder Woman had killed the Sith Assassins and was no longer cut off from the Force. He learned that she had led Darth Nihilus to his death at Mitra's hands, but she had also betrayed the Jedi Exile. Kreia had once again assumed the persona of Darth Treya. Though he initially wanted to kill her, Treya was eventually able to bend Darth Sion to her will and told him to prepare for Mitra's arrival. And when the Jedi did come, after having fought her way through the Sith forces at the Academy on Malachor, she finally stood before Sion once again. He urged her to leave, as Darth Treya would bend her will as she had bent his. Sion thought of himself as Treya's greatest student, even greater than Revan. His betrayal of her had just been one of her tests, which he had passed. Once the two of them began to duel, Mitra struck down the Sith Lord multiple times. Now, of course, he just kept getting back up, so Mitra tried to convince Sion that Treya was only using him as a tool for her machinations. However, Sion was certain that if he could kill the Jedi exile, Treya would have no choice but to make him her true apprentice. Mitra then explained to the Sith Lord how wrong he was, and Treya only respected those who were able to let go of the Force, not beings such as Sion, who depended on it completely just to live. Mitra's words resonated with the Sith Lord. Now, of all the things in the galaxy, Sion was most repulsed by it was weakness. That is why he had embraced pain as strength in the first place. But now he saw that his life or unlife of pain was ultimately one that was permanently reliant on the Force and therefore was another form of weakness. Disguised by this revelation, Sion let go of the pain and finally allowed himself to die, much like Vader did at the end of Return of the Jedi. But he did not do so before telling Mitra that she was Darth Treya's weakness, just as she had been Sion's. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this Legends video about Darth Sion. He was a pretty cool Sith Lord, or you know, immortal, and uh, this kind of makes me wonder if this is perhaps the path that Palpatine took 
to survive episode 6 and come back in episode 9. So let me know. There are tons of different videos that I'm going to be making from Legends about all these cool different Sith Lords and their powers and how they survived death. So maybe, you know, they took some inspiration for this uh, from these different lore stories and legend stories from these Sith Lords and maybe applied them to Palpatine for his return. Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day so far. Handsome, charming, and charismatic, Skir Khan was exceptionally skilled in the use of mind tricks, battle meditation, and military tactics during the last years of the Republic's Dark Age. This was a term given the last century of the New Sith Wars when the Republic could no longer maintain communication with any of its settlements outside the core, and basically ceased to exist. Born into this turbulent time on Coruscant, Khan was taken in by the Jedi Order where he soon rose to the rank of Jedi Knight, and his keen mind and sophisticated knowledge of economic policy and fleet command proved a valuable asset for the Order. Though he did begin to become critical of the Jedi, blaming them and the Republic, which what was left of it, for the anarchy that had spread throughout the galaxy for all these centuries of war with the Sith. Despite his radical views, the High Council hoped to use Khan's mastery of battle meditation, which was a force ability that boosts the morale, stamina, and overall battle powers of the user's allies, while also, you know, simultaneously reducing the enemy's combat effectiveness and eroding their will to fight. They were hoping to use this to put an end to the centuries-long war with the reformed Sith Empire. So, they promoted him to Jedi Master in an attempt to moderate his behavior and objections. But their efforts did not appease Khan, who saw the Jedi Council as more and more tyrannical. So he left Coruscant and took a group of fellow Jedi Knights who shared his views with him and formed the Brotherhood of Darkness, declaring himself Dark Lord of the Sith. So I don't know if you guys can see, but there seems to be a running theme that Jedi just become fed up with the Jedi Order and the Jedi Council, and they go and start their own thing, which basically turns them into a Dark Lord of the Sith. Now, he was known as the Dark One by his followers. Khan's ascension to Dark Lord came during a time where the Sith Empire, instead of focusing their combined might on crushing the ailing Republic, had become fractured between dozens of Sith Lords all waging war against each other for the right to claim the title Dark Lord for themselves. So Khan realized he had to unite the splintered Sith under his rule, or the unending infighting for more power and supremacy would lead to their destruction for good. He eliminated any who refused to join him, and once he was able to recruit two powerful Sith warlords, more followers soon joined up with Khan's brotherhood. Completely blind to the threat that Khan was becoming, as he amassed more power, the Jedi High Council actually sent their congratulations to him for the killing of several key Sith warlords who had stood in his way as he was reorganizing the Sith into his brotherhood. Only the Jedi Lord Hoth, yeah, there was a brief period where a select few very powerful Jedi held the title of Lord, understood what Khan had become, and so he too left Coruscant to gather forces of his own to fight the menace Khan had become. Khan's philosophy was unique among the Sith. He had seen how the dark side users would eventually challenge each other for the self-proclaimed title Dark Lord. This caused an endless cycle of destruction that threatened undoing the ongoing war effort. So, in an attempt to try to break that pattern, Khan declared that all are equal in the Brotherhood of Darkness. Khan ruled with the idea of cooperation and equality among the Sith Lords and therefore named all of the members of the Brotherhood Dark Lord of the Sith. Though, to prevent the past from repeating itself, Khan forbade any of his Sith Lords from taking the title Darth, because that particular honorary, in Khan's view, had always been responsible for all the infighting and jealous destruction within their ranks. And thus, there were no Darths in the Brotherhood. Well, except for one. But he showed up towards the end of the war. In fact, he was responsible for ending it, actually. So his name, which a lot of you might know, was Darth Bane but that comes a little bit later in today's video. Under Khan's banner, the Brotherhood of Darkness struck back at the Republic and Jedi. However, Lord Hoth gathered the Jedi Grand Council, not to be confused with the High Council, as it was not an official governing body, but instead existed outside the jurisdiction of the Jedi. Composed of a collection of those group of Jedi who had taken up the title of Lord, the Grand Council made decisions on their behalf and helped safeguard the territories under the Jedi Lord's protection. With the Jedi Grand Council, Hoth was able to form the Army of Light, 
a military force made up of those Jedi Knights, Jedi Lords, and loyal Republic troops, tired of the government's ineffectual leadership. Once established, Hoth led his new army against Khan in a decade-long bloody and destructive war that saw massive casualties on both sides. At the start of the war, Khan's brilliant strategies provided the Sith with victory after victory. He even took back the old homeworld of the Sith, Korriban, and reopened a Sith Academy for his instructors to train new Sith recruits. However, Khan's charisma and ability to control weak-willed beings, along with his military tactics, kept the Brotherhood strong. His hold on his authority was fragile, but the Sith remained united as long as Khan kept providing the victories. After successfully conquering planet after planet, including Kashyyyk, Khan put his sights next on the planet Wusan, a world near Kashyyyk mostly insignificant. However, Lord Hoth's Army of Light had arrived on Wusan to confront and wipe out the Brotherhood for good. Though outnumbered in sheer manpower by the Army of the Light, Khan was still certain of victory regardless. For the Jedi had spread themselves thin in their attempts at protecting the native population of Rusan, plus the defection of a Jedi named Githany, who would almost become the first Sith apprentice in Bane's Rule of Two, provided the Sith with vital intel on Hoth's battle plans and strategies. So, with those elements in his favor and confident of victory, Khan sent for reinforcements, regardless of the high numbers of casualties the Brotherhood was suffering. But despite Khan's own certainties, the tide of the war was steadily turning in the Republic's favor. They had recently reclaimed territory previously under the Brotherhood's control, including a group of mining systems in the Inner Rim. So, though most of his followers remained loyal, a few of the more prominent Dark Lords, most notably Bane, who at this stage of the war had joined the Sith, within the Brotherhood, were starting to express doubts with Khan's leadership. Darth Bane, in particular, was disgusted with how Khan was going about handling the war. He thought the leader of the Brotherhood was not using the dark side of the Force how he should be using it, because Khan was too busy thinking too much like a, and I quote, dirt general and not a Sith Lord. Of course, Khan had a different point of view on the matter. He saw Bane as a threat to his leadership. Not only was his Darth title in direct violation of his orders, but Bane was ready to challenge him. So, Khan decided that Bane needed to be eliminated, and first sent the Sith Academy's top swordmaster, and one of Bane's former masters, to deal with the defiant Sith Lord. When Bane survived that confrontation, Khan sent the turncoat former Jedi Githany, who had a romantic relationship with Bane, to poison him but he survived the second attempt too. But then to Khan's surprise, Bane sent the Dark One a peace offering of sorts. An ancient scroll inscribed with a forgotten Sith ritual called the Thought Bomb. The ritual was performed through sheer focused willpower that upon release would detonate and unleash a full volley of the dark side of the Force, obliterating any Force-sensitive being caught within its radius, ripping out their fragmented souls into a vortex of eternal torment that transformed into a shimmering silver orb. Yeah, this is some super intense and weird Sith weapon. Khan accepted Bane's gift, and he, as well as the other members of the Brotherhood, meditated and focused their dark energy, and as one, with their combined power, attacked the Jedi and their army of light through the Force, which proved to be a devastating blow to Lord Hoth's forces, leaving victory within the Sith's grasp. Sensing Jedi defeat was imminent, and feeling impatient and overconfident, the other Sith Lords broke the meditation circle and took the fight to the field to finish off the survivors. However, the Jedi were not as weak as the Sith had hoped. In part, due to Darth Bane's machinations. He had signaled the Sith Armada in orbit of Rusan to break formation and attack the opposing Republic fleet. This would keep the Sith fleet busy, allowing the Jedi to send in for reinforcements and stage a counterattack against Khan. Most of the Sith Masters died in the ensuing battle until Khan took his remaining forces into a deep cave and waited for the Jedi to begin their final strike. It was here, with no more options left, he decided to use the Thought Bomb. He believed it would destroy the Jedi, but that he and his Sith Lords would be strong enough to survive it. When Lord Hoth and his Army of Light finally did arrive to engage the Brotherhood, Khan detonated the Thought Bomb, which resulted in not just the annihilation of Lord Hoth's forces, but Khan himself 
the Brotherhood, and any force sensitive within the radius of the blast. This devastation marked the end of the New Sith Wars, and the Sith, as an organization, were presumed extinct by the Jedi and the galaxy at large. But Darth Bane and his new apprentice, Darth Xana, were far enough away from the thought bomb detonated and survived to secretly form the New Sith Order, which would follow the Rule of Two. Though all the Jedi and Sith alike who had been in the radius of the blast now had their essence trapped within the Thought Bomb Vortex for all of time, somehow Khan's consciousness was able to escape and communicate with Bane and guide his former rival to a Sith holocron that had once belonged to Freedon Nod. Nod's holocron contained knowledge that would help Bane restore the Sith Order, but it was also a trick to expose the now only Dark Lord in existence to parasitic creatures known as orbalisks. These parasitic creatures would attach themselves to the skin of their hosts, causing the wearer great pain as they fed and multiplied, growing all over the body until they eventually enveloped and suffocated their victim. Their hard shells did provide protection, however. In fact, orbalisk armor's durability was so tough that even lightsabers had a hard time from penetrating them. If they were removed or killed, the Orbalisks would release a highly potent and lethal toxin into the host's body. Either way, whether they remained and grew on the host or were removed, the result was always death. Though Bane was able to prevent the Orbalisks from covering his face, hands, and feet, he was now covered in them and used their hard shells as a living armor. A millennium later, the Sith Lord, who would be the last of Bane's rule of two, Darth Vader used one of Khan's indestructible Sith amulets in the construction of one of his gloves. Though charming, handsome, charismatic, and a brilliant strategist and a master of mind tricks, Khan, though intelligent, was himself weak-willed and used the rule by the strong that the Brotherhood of Darkness preached as a cover for his own weakness. A weakness that would ultimately result in the defeats that he suffered in the last days of the war driving him insane enough to use the Thought Bomb which caused his own death and ended the Sith Order that he commanded for good. I hope you guys enjoyed this Legends video. Let me know what you want me to cover next. Please leave a like on it if you did enjoy it. And let me know what you think of Vader using one of Khan's indestructible Sith amulets in the construction of one of his gloves. Ask me of my heritage and I shall tell you. Ask me of my ambitions and you shall know them. Ask me for my hand in battle and I shall likely lend you both. But ask me the secrets of Sith alchemy, and I would ask you for three measures of blood, one from a person you love, one from a person you hate, and one from yourself. One of the most powerful Sith magicians during the reign of the Dark Lord of the Sith, Marka Ragnos' rule, Nagasato, began his life on the forest planet of Zyost, within the Sith Empire. Surrounded by the Stygian Caldera, a large nebula that made hyperspace travel very difficult to navigate, the Sith had become a rich but isolated civilization, concealed from the larger galaxy around them. 2,000 years before Sado's birth, the Second Great Schism had occurred. It was a divisive split amongst the ranks of the Jedi Order, which led to war between the Jedi and those of their order who had fallen to the Dark Side of the Force. The war resulted in the Darksiders' defeat. After they fled the Jedi, they discovered the home world of the Sith, the Dark Jedi conquered and interbred with the Sith species, becoming Sith Lords and establishing their own Sith Empire. Sado, as a result, was a half-breed, part Sith pureblood, and a master of alchemy. He preached a philosophy of expansion, at a period where the Sith Empire, though powerful, was facing economic and technological stagnation due to its isolation from the rest of the galaxy. However, the actions of the Jedi and the Republic during the Second Great Schism still hung over the Sith society. The Sith always feared the Republic's return, believing it would mean the end of them all. So, from birth on, Nagasato was trained to fight this threat, should they ever return. His mentor and teacher was the Sith Lord, Simis, who Sato saw as a guiding figure throughout his life even after Simus became a head in a jar. Simus once tried to fight Mark Aragnos for the title of Dark Lord. He lost by being beheaded, but refused to die. Using the dark side, he kept himself alive as just a severed head in a crystalline container for the rest of his days. But he was made part of the Sith Council, where he was highly respected and valued for his wisdom. Sado would eventually rise in power and status, joining the Sith Council himself. As the waning years of Marco Ragnos' century-long rule, Sado, like his mentor Simus before him, began to want to covet the title of Dark Lord of the Sith for himself. 
Frustrated by the Sith's stagnation and isolationist attitudes, Sato believed change was necessary, that the Empire had to expand. So, when Marco Ragnos finally died, Sato saw a chance for him to implement that change if he could become the new Dark Lord. But another Sith, Ludo Kresh, also made claim to the title. So, in Sith tradition, Sato and Kresh had to duel each other to the death. Facing off on the threshold of Marco Ragnos' tomb, they fought each other with force-imbued blades. However, neither one of them would get a chance to victory as suddenly the spirit of Marco Ragnos appeared before them, warning the two Siths and the onlookers that the golden age of the Sith was nearing its end and they would have to fight the correct battles or else be destroyed. Sado and Kresh both didn't have much time to ponder what the dead Sith Lord's message meant when they suddenly saw the unexpected sight of a Republic starship appear. On board were a pair of siblings, Gav and Jory Darrigan, trailblazers, charting hyperspace routes and claiming to have come to set up trade relations between the Sith Empire and the Republic. Kresh wanted the intruders executed immediately, but Nagasato saw an opportunity in the Explorer's presence and saved them from his rival by having the two imprisoned on Zyost. Sato believed that a war with the Republic could be the unifying event the Sith Empire needed to put a stop to its ever-increasing split and growing political weaknesses. He pleaded with the Sith Council to keep the Republic visitors alive, as their knowledge of the rest of the galaxy could lead to greater Sith domination and control. His pleads were ignored. The Council ordered them to be put to death, but Sato's ambitions would not be stopped. He led a team to raid the prison with a small strike team, freeing the Daragons and using one of their Republic blasters to kill his mentor and teacher, and possibly the only person he respected in the galaxy, Simus. He purposefully left the weapon behind at the scene. He placed the Republic pair at his secret stronghold on the icy moon of Kar Shion, then returned to Zyos to see if his strike had resulted in the reaction he wanted. It had. The Sith Council concluded from finding the Republic blaster that the Republic was behind the assassination, pretending shock and outrage at Seamus' death, or Simus, however you guys want to pronounce it really. Sato demanded the Sith strike back. Several Council members supported Sato in his call for vengeance, but others didn't. The side that supported Sato and the one who stood with Kresh had to come to a head. The victor would be the new Dark Lord. Sensing Gav Darragon was force sensitive, he had once been a low level Jedi initiate. Sato realized he had found someone with a strong, though untrained connection with the Force. So seeing potential in him, Sato decided to train him as an apprentice and teach him Sith magic. But Ludo Kresh attacked Sato's citadel on the planet Kar Delba. Although completely unconcerned with Kresh's attack, his true stronghold was a secret base on the planet's icy moon. Sato fiend panic. He ushered Jory Darragon to her Republic starship, outfitted with a tracking device, claiming he was protecting her from all the horrors Kresh would do if he got his hands on her. In reality, he simply wanted her to escape and lead, while her brother would stay at his side as his Sith apprentice. Once she had made the jump to hyperspace, Sato called in his fleet, which had been hiding on the dark side of the planet's moon. The fleet's arrival took Kresh by surprise and forced him into retreat. Thus, having defeated Kresh, Nagasato became the new undisputed Dark Lord of the Sith. With his ultimate rival seemingly out of the picture, the new Dark Lord united the other Sith Lords under him and began building a massive armada to invade the Republic. He placed his Sith apprentice, Gav, who had no command experience, in charge of one of his flagships. Despite objections from his apprentice about leaving Sith space undefended, Sato launched a destructive surprise attack on the Republic. The strategy was a many-pronged assault at conquering the key Koro system, while simultaneously another part of his fleet would seize the Republic capital planet, Coruscant. Sato, unlike what Darth Vader would have done, didn't fight on the front lines. Instead, the Dark Lord isolated himself within a Sith meditation sphere, using his powers to augment his forces with illusionary beasts and ships, making his fleet appear to be tens of thousands of ships more powerful. Initially, Sadao's strategy was incredibly successful, so much so that the Republic was on the cusp of defeat, but then events turned against the Dark Lord of the Sith. His apprentice, Gav Darragon, shamed by his sister Jory for the death and destruction he had helped to bring to the Republic he once belonged to, Gav turned against the dark side and attacked Sato in his meditation sphere, causing his concentration to break and illusions to scatter and disappear across the galaxy. Having no choice but to return to Sith space, Sato used Sith magic to trigger a supernova, which covered his retreat but also killed his apprentice. 
Though Gav was able to inform his sister and her allies that Sadow had left Sith space undefended before his death. Returning home to lick his wounds and plan for a second round, Sadow was met with an unexpected and unwelcome surprise waiting for him, Ludo Kresh, who had proclaimed himself the Dark Lord of the Sith in Sadow's absence. He was waiting to greet Nega Sadow with his own army, engaging in battle. Kresh nearly overwhelmed Sadow's forces, but one of Sadow's pilots made a suicide run on Kresh's flagship, killing Sadow's great rival and breaking the will of his forces. But just as he had his victory, the pursuing Republic forces showed up and attacked. With no way to win, Sadow and his damaged warship made a daring run and flew between the binary stars of the Denari Nova. While the Republic forces chasing close behind him, using his knowledge of Sith magics again, the Dark Lord manipulated the solar flares of the stars into destroying the Republic ships following him and covering his retreat, but the stresses placed on the stars caused the entire system to be destroyed. Though the Republic didn't believe that Sadow had been destroyed, he had in fact been able to make his escape to the uncharted Yavin system and made a home with his remaining Masasi, a subspecies of the ancient pure-blood Sith race, forces of the uninhabited moon of Yavin 4. Raising huge massive temples, the ones used by the Rebel Alliance during A New Hope many millennia later, Sadow would spend decades practicing his alchemy alone, learning to assert his will on the natural order of the universe. He set his sight on creating a race of warriors powerful enough to protect what remained of his legacy. So, he experimented on his Masasi slaves, mutating them into powerful, violent, and hateful beings. He also turned a space slug that had attached itself to his ship into a giant monster that could swallow a Jedi in one bite, the colossal Sith Worm, which for centuries lived deep under Sado's temples. However, Sado soon faced a revolt, a tribe of Masasi who had managed to escape his horrifying experiments, resented his terrible rule and attacked his temples fighting through his twisted mutations and defenses, until confronting the Dark Lord face to face. Sadow commended them on their bravery, then unleashed hundreds of his mutated mindless Masasi on them. He took them captive and subjected them to the very same experiments. After further decades diving deeper and deeper into Sith alchemy, Sadow decided to place himself into suspended animation, vowing not to re-emerge until a new apprentice had risen, to take the Sith back into a new golden age, about 600 years later, that day came, when he was awoken by a fallen Jedi named Freedon Nad, and I will be covering him in full in another video. Believing Nad to be the apprentice he was looking for, Sadow taught him his Sith secrets, which Nad would then use later to turn on Sadow and kill the Dark Lord. Though long dead, Naga Sadow's legacy would live on. His attack on the Republic and daring escape would inspire subsequent generations of Sith, including the future Dark Lord of the Sith, Exar Kun and even later, Darth Sidious, who found an ancient holocron containing records of Sadow's Sith alchemy secrets, a knowledge which Sidious would guard with his life. Hey everyone, how are you all doing today? So I know many of you have seen this cool cinematic, and while a lot of you have played the game and know the background, many don't. So I figured I'd go over a brief video on just who and what this is all about. Now, Arkin is one of my favorite characters in Star Wars lore. Him and his twin brother, Thexen, they were the sons of one of the most powerful Sith Emperors in all of Star Wars, Valkorion. Think of these two like Star Wars version of the movie 300, except we'll call it Twin Sons. They were both princes, and they trained from birth. They knew how to fight, use force powers, and harness their powers gifted to them in their bloodline. Once they reached adulthood, their father sent them to do his bidding, waging wars on different planets in the name of domination. Now, just like any brother, or sister, or twins, one is always going to be different than the other, and that was very much the case with Arkan. Always doubting and resenting his father, where Thexen followed his father's orders blindly. Arkan was a naturally strong force user and a highly skilled duelist, being able to defeat both Sith Lords and Jedi Knights. Mastering his yellow-bladed lightsaber indicative of knowledge and intellect, he demonstrated use of yellow force lightning and powerful force pushes, which shows a great proficiency of telekinesis. His most powerful and well-versed ability was the use of Force Lightning. Even with a cybernetic arm holding back his true potential from becoming a master of the ability, which we'll discuss how he lost his arm in a little bit of detail in a bit, he, like his father, was able to conjure small storms with the ability. Both him and his brother were powerful leaders of the Eternal Empire's armed forces. They waged war against the Galactic Republic, driving them back and putting them to the brink of extinction. However, during one of their many battles, 
Arkin was severely wounded, losing his left arm and taking disfiguring damage to his face. After the battle, we can see that he received a new cybernetic arm and a mask, covering half of his jaw and face. It was after this battle when they returned victorious to their father, Valkorion, presenting lightsabers of both Jedi and Sith as trophies of their success in battle. Their father turns away without so much as a glance at the weapons or his sons. Arkan didn't like this. He had had enough. He had sacrificed so much. And within an instant, the dark side ignited in Arkan's eyes as he became furious at his father's lack of compassion and caring and their sacrifices to his empire. Full of hatred, he ignites his lightsaber and leaps at his father with every intention to strike him down, where Thexen pulls his brother back with the Force in an attempt to save his father's life. However, Arkan, still with the hot rage of the dark side flowing deep within him, turns his fury on his brother and exchanged blow after blow. It didn't last long. He saw an opening and lashed out, striking his brother across the torso and killing him. Thexen glances at his brother with a look of resignation, and the light of the dark side faded from Arkin's eyes as he realized what he had done. Cradling his brother in his arms, Thexen dies of his wounds. As a massive shadow approached him, Arkan saw his father standing over him, reaching his arm out and imploring him to come with him and rule his empire. That's the brief story of Arkan. I can go over Thexen in another one if you guys want. So obviously besides the fact that this is just a beautiful cinematic and beautiful story, basically what Valkorion wanted was one son, but only the most powerful. And through this test of killing his brother, Arkan was deemed as his heir. Now one power in particular that Arkan was really good at was Tutaminus, which was the ability to stop blaster bolts and lightsabers and force abilities with his hands. He was capable of defending against his father's force storm for a brief period of time, kind of like we saw Yoda do with Palpatine. His other skills were in politics, and after taking control of Zakul, he made it the most powerful political fraction of the galaxy. He also had a degree of talent as a military commander, managing to defeat both the Republic and Empire within the short span of one year with the might of the Eternal Fleet.